Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about eternal inflation. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about uh, Stephen Hawking's last paper on cosmology, um, which appeared just a few months ago. So eternal inflation refers to a phase of inflation in the early universe uh, deep into the regime of inflation, where quantum fluctuations dominate the uh, dynamics. And because they are dominated the dynamics, um, their typical picture that goes with eternal inflation is this one, due to Andre Linde, uh, in which the quantum effects are modeled as stochastic effects on top of a classical background, but because they're stochastic, this leads on very large scales to a kind of image of our universe as a mosaic of pocket universes of different kinds. Now this image, which is an extrapolation, a wild extrapolation of our usual theory of slow roll inflation, leads to a problem. Because we are in one of those pockets, and the theory doesn't tell us which one, and therefore we, theorists, are unable to tell our observational friends what they should expect to observe. So the question Stephen and I were interested in, is this a feature, is this a physical prediction of the extrapolation of the theory of inflation? Or is this eyewash? Is this really a kind of IR divergency of our usual theory of inflation? The only way to answer this question is to get a better theory of inflation. That is, try to formulate inflation in quantum mechanical terms. And that's what our paper is about. The exit from eternal inflation in the title of our paper refers, in our view, to the transition from what you could say is a quantum realm of our universe to a classical universe, a universe which obeys Einstein's equation. What we want to get out of such a theory is a resolution of that predictability crisis which I mentioned uh, just uh, a minute ago. And perhaps an understanding of the extent to which that mosaic kind of image of our universe on the larger scales is really uh, part of reality. Now, of course, we were not the first ones to think about inflation from a quantum perspective, or more generally, the origin of the universe from a quantum perspective. In fact, in the very early days of modern cosmology in the 30s, George Lemaitre wrote a short paper with the title, The Beginning of the World from the Point of View of Quantum Theory. And he too had in mind a kind of state, if I may call it that way, which was not interpretable in the usual space-time uh, picture. But Lemaitre was clever enough not to write down a single equation about this. In fact, it took uh, quite a few decades for the first rough model of how such a quantum origin of our universe may look like to be proposed. In fact, that happened here in Rome in the, um, one of the workshops organized by the Pontifical Academy, I believe, in the early 80s. Um, you find in the uh, proceedings, all the way at the end, page 563, a short contribution from Stephen Hawking called the boundary conditions of the universe, in which he first proposed um, his model, if I may say so, for the quantum origin of the universe. What did Stephen have in mind? Well, the slogan that comes with this model is that the boundary conditions of the universe is that it has no boundary. What he did was he envisioned applying the same Euclidean techniques that Malcolm just mentioned to cosmology, he envisioned a kind of quantum creation of our universe which replaces the 
classical singularity at the initial time by a kind of um, smooth quantum origin. He had in mind um, a, a process similar to pair creation. Now, the no boundary thing is very similar to what Molko mentioned in the case of black holes, except that here we're inside. It is often said that cosmology is like a black hole inside out. Well, the no boundary, the motivation for the no boundary proposal of, for the origin of the universe was precisely to kind of coarse grain or trace over everything we can't observe, the realm of reality beyond our classical observational universe. But to put this on somewhat firm footing, you have to think about our universe in quantum mechanical terms as a wave function. And what you see here is just one branch, some origin which leads to one specific CMB, one specific set of pixels on the sky. This is just one branch of the wave function, which in itself describes um, what you could say uh, is a multiverse. Now, the crux of the no boundary proposal is that um, it was made explicit by Hartle and Hawking a year later, and it was proposed to weight different branches of the wave function, different final configurations, different final Laurentian universes, as you see there, by the Euclidean action of the uh, complex saddle point solution, which you see there. If you substitute that into the action, you find that that Laurentian part of the evolution at late times really contributes to the phase of the wave function. That phase is what really predicts classical cosmological evolution. But the bottom part, which is not interpretable in terms of Laurentian classical cosmology, the bottom part of the picture contributes to the amplitude of the wave function. So you get not just a multiverse out of a, th out of a quantum theory, you get a multiverse, but each universe in this ensemble of parallel worlds comes with a certain amplitude A. And that is really where, in my opinion, the physics lies. Now, I should say that the no boundary proposal is a proposal. It didn't come with precise instructions. Uh, clearly, the idea was to uh, get the volume in a smooth way to zero, but what are the precise no boundary initial conditions that realize this on all the fields that was uh, left for future work and our paper could be viewed as uh, a step in the direction towards clarifying those. Very much like in Malcolm's talk, he was clarifying the nature of the physics on the horizon. Now, the key success of the no-boundary proposal, in my view, so the, a, a first question you should now ask is, well, okay, I have a multiverse. What kind of universes do have a large probability, a large amplitude A? Well, the key success of the no-boundary proposal is that it selects universes with an early period of inflation. And the reason is that inflation, in contrast to any random extrapolation of our universe backwards in time, inflation is a kind of past which is potential dominated, in which the gradient terms remain under control. It turns out that only those Laurentian classical universes can be rounded off smoothly uh, in the way Hartland Hawking envisioned. So in a way, it's a selection principle which um, assigns a high prior to inflation. To quote Stephen and Jim, the no boundary wave function is peaked around inflationary universes. It explains in why inflation started in the first place with perturbations initially in their ground state. The perturbations are in their ground state because that's what it has to be in order to satisfy the smoothness condition on the perturbations. As I mentioned, you might wonder, well, why am I interested? I'm just happy that inflation is going on. 
there's a bonus here. You don't only explain how inflation started, you get different inflationary universes, each with their own amplitude, A. A is a function of the kind of universe you're considering. So if you're an observer, and if you're interested in CMB observations, then this is useful. If we look at the usual Planck diagrams, you have the observations, and on top of that, you have all the different theories. Some of the theories are within the observational constraints, and other models of inflation are not. The paradigm of inflation itself, therefore, does not provide very sharp predictions. Looking, looking at that at face value, you see, well, the theory is rather spread out. Certainly, in the modern view, in which string theorists like to think as all of these different models of inflation being realized in a huge scalar landscape kind of potential. A theory of initial conditions is the solution to this problem because it will provide a prior which assigns a relative weighting to these different models of inflation and which yields much sharper predictions. Now, so far, the good news about the Nobunary proposal, it basically works, I believe, when you have slow roll inflation, in which the fluctuations are in their ground state and there are small fluctuations around basically a classical background. But many of these models of inflation, higher up the scalar potential, have what is called a regime of eternal inflation in which the classical slow roll-down is much smaller than the quantum fluctuations um, set by the variance of the wave function. So that's a regime where the potential is flat compared to its uh, value. The usual law is that because these quantum fluctuations are large, in eternal inflation, globally, on the largest scales, your reheating surface will be very inhomogeneous. In wave function terms, this means that the wave function is spread out. The wave function is no longer peaked around a set of classical backgrounds, approximately classical backgrounds, but it becomes spread out. It mixes different backgrounds. It wipes out the separation between backgrounds and fluctuations. And a little bit of an extrapolation of that is that if, even if you ha had started on the right-hand side, fluctuations will occasionally jump, on, uh, jump you to the left-hand side and you get sort of a mix of universes and again, you end up with a predictability crisis. If the CMB that is resulting from rolling the ref to the, down from the right side and the left side is different, then again, we will not be able to tell our friends observing what kind of CMB exactly they should expect to see. So in quantum cosmology terms, the crisis of eternal inflation is the question whether the wave function spreads out evenly over all possible inflationary histories. And that is really the sort of statement in quantum cosmology terms that comes with this picture. So, a few years ago, we decided that um, we needed a better formulation of the no-boundary proposal, which was able to confront this predictability crisis, this IR divergency. And we turned to holography, which meanwhile had emerged as a very powerful tool in high energy physics. Holography relates gravity in ADS to quantum field theory on the boundary of ADS. Here's a Euclidean version of it, in which you basically have Euclidean ADS, or hyperbolic space, connected to um, quantum field, Euclidean quantum field theories on the boundary. The idea of applying holography to cosmology is then to relate the no-boundary proposal, or to rewrite it in terms of the partition function of a quantum field theory defined directly on the surface 
on which we evaluate our wave function. So the wave function is a function of the geometry and the field configuration on a surface of constant time. The partition function is derived directly on that surface, Lives, is defined directly on that surface. And the question is, can we use this to evaluate the boundary wave function in eternal inflation? Now, the first question you're going to ask is, hey, where is ADS? Because, of course, we are interested in universes which inflate and which have a positive cosmological constant and so forth. It turns out that ADS is that we can find ADS. It requires a closer look at the uh, no boundary geometries I mentioned before. The canonical representation of the saddle points of the no boundary wave function is as a sort of transition between Euclidean de Sitter, which is a deformed four sphere, into smoothly going into a Laurentian inflating uh, classical cosmology. The key point about those saddle points is the final boundary conditions, the argument of the wave function, and the initial boundary conditions, regularity and smoothness but in between, this particular geo representation is but one possible geometric representation of those saddle points. It turns out there are other representations satisfying the same boundary conditions. And this is one. It turns out the same wave function with the same action and the same weighting can be obtained or can be represented in terms of a transition between a Euclidean ADS regime into a Laurentian inflating or the Sitter regime. If you do so, so in other words, at the level of the wave function, which uses, because it's a quantum mechanical object, which lives with, with complex geometries, there is a natural connection between Euclidean anti the Sitter space and Laurentian the Sitter space. In this representation, in this new representation, the weighting of the final configurations which we're interested in, the amplitude A, is given not by the original uh, the Sitter part, but by the action of the Euclidean ADS region, whereas the phase comes from the Laurentian. So working with that representation, we have a natural connection with holography because we know how to deal with Euclidean ADS and holography. We can replace the Euclidean ADS region by a field theory, a dual field theory, a Euclidean dual field theory defined on its final boundary. The amplitude in this holographic form of the no-boundary wave function will then be given by the partition function of that field theory defined directly on the boundary. So here we have our setup. The idea now is that the partition function of that dual field theory specifies the amplitude of different initial geometries G and field configurations phi. We have, in other words, an explicitation a kind of microscopic picture of what originally these uh, vague no boundary initial conditions were. With that setup, we want to revisit eternal inflation and in particular ask the question um, what that dual partition function predicts for those amplitudes. In order to do so, we put it at the exit of eternal inflation, or if you go from the present backwards to the past, we put it deep into the inflation regime where we hit the threshold for eternal inflation. Anything which came before or after or outside is by now uh, excised from the um, geometry in much the same way as the interior of Malcolm's black holes were excised from the Euclidean geometries. So we worked out a toy model 
in which we could evaluate that partition function. How much time do I have? Okay, no worries. We worked out a toy model uh, consisting just of a single scalar field, 15, um, which has in the bulk, so we, which has from, from the usual perspective, a regime of eternal inflation. In other words, a uh, regime where the quantum fluctuations are large and the classical roll down is small. And this is a toy model version of eternal inflation because the usual analysis would lead you to believe that the reheating surface or the exit surface of eternal inflation, which evolves classically to the reheating surface, is on the larger scales extremely inhomogeneous. That is because the fluctuations are large and gradually this builds up. This builds up. It's a stochastic effect and um, you're led to this, to this uh, picture. Now, there's a key characteristic of such large, inhomogeneous uh, reheating surfaces, which is that they will have patches where the curvature is positive and other patches where the curvature is negative. If you wish, this is a kind of regularized version of what is known as bubble creation or bubble universes, where the surfaces of constant density inside those bubbles have a negative uh, curvature. So this is an ideal toy model which captures a crucial feature which we associate with eternal inflation, namely the fact that there are infinite or approximately but, or very large regions of negative curvature. We wanted to see whether you can, whether, whether the dual field, whether the holographic form of the no boundary proposal predicts those structures. In order to do so, we evaluated the partition function of toy model dual field theories defined directly on those final surfaces. So the geometry of the final surface is in there as a source in the partition function together with the scalar field, which we take to be constant on that surface because we are interested in constant density surfaces. Now, those partition functions are difficult to compute. We obviously can't do this for the most general metric deformations, the general ge ge three geometries of those surfaces, but we can look at deformations in, a specific, di in specific directions. Directions which include um, directions for which the tree curvature becomes negative. The partition function is basically a Euclidean field theory integral um, sourced by the uh, relevant operators. What we found, at least in those toy models, was that the probability A stands for a particular deformation of the geometry of the final surface here. Um, we found that the probability distribution, the amplitudes derived from the partition functions, um, is a function of deformations of the uh, final geometry of the um, exit surface that those probability, uh, probabilities are peaked sharply around the round tree sphere, so the smooth tree sphere um, homogeneous universe we're familiar with. Large fluctuations of the geometry are suppressed, no significant spreading is observed, no evidence, in other words, for that large inhomogeneous structure. In fact, there is a general argument. Those partition functions, we expect to diverge quite generally on when they are evaluated on geometries which have significant patches of negative curvature. And that is simply because the curvature enters as a mass term in all those partition function calculations. And the mass term will be positive and suppress fluctuations whenever the curvature is positive. But the mass term will do the opposite thing when the curvature becomes negative, leading typically to divergent partition functions, which is just what we observe. Now, since 
the relation between the no boundary weighting and the partition function is the inverse of each other. A divergent partition function means basically zero probabilities for such deformed geometries. So that is a rather general argument which we observe playing out uh, at the level of our toy model calculations, which suggest that the holographic measure will strongly suppress large deformations. So we, are, we were led in our paper to a conjecture, which is how we concluded our paper, saying that holography indicates that the exit from eternal inflation gives a reasonably smooth Big Bang. To wrap up, here are my conclusions. The exit from eternal inflation I view as the birth of a classical universe. A reliable theory of eternal inflation must therefore be based on quantum cosmology. And the reason you might be interested in that is that such a theory should provide a prior that sharpens the predictions of slow roll inflation. It's a selection between different slow roll models in your theory. The usual account of eternal inflation, which is an extrapolation of our classical theory of inflation, it gives rise to a fractal-like multiverse on the larger scales, but we have put forward a novel holographic description of eternal inflation, which appears to predict a smooth Big Bang. The key open question is what does that imply for our observations on smaller, smaller scales, on observable scales? Clearly, one expects a better theory of the very large-scale structure to have tail effects which we might hope to observe on the largest accessible scales. But that is uh, future work. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Again, we're moving along quite well. So is there a question? That's a good question. The, so the evidence that you're referring to is that classical de Sitter space may not exist as a stable theory. But in holography, you never use that classical extrapolation. The theory is defined in terms of a partition function. And to me, it's an interesting question to what extent are classical notions of space and time can be derived from that, can be, can be deduced, can be followed uh, from that theory. So I'm not so convinced that these two statements, holographic cosmology on the one hand and the instability of classical de Sitter space on the other hand, are in conflict. But it's a very important point to clarify further. Well, thank you, Thomas. And uh, our next speaker.